Hi and welcome back to a new video. As you probably know, we are currently developing our GPU full cover water blocks for Thermal Grizzly. And part of that development is also testing nickel coating for both temperature performance, but also for corrosion resistance. And that can go quite well if you use the right coolant, but it can also go terribly wrong if you use the wrong coolant, AKA just distilled water without any kind of additives or in inhibitors. And while doing all the testing, talking to colleagues and also talking to other people on Discord, it kind of came to our attention that most people are not really aware of how much of a problem it is just using distilled water without any inhibitors. And that's why we want to deep dive down into this topic in today's video. You think your data is automatically GDPR compliant just because the server is located in Germany? It's actually not that simple. Due to the US Cloud Act, any American company can be forced to hand over data to US authorities, even if it's hosted in Europe. European providers like Hetzner, on the other hand, are subject to EU data regulations and are therefore not affected by the US Cloud Act. Combined with the right settings and contracts, you can ensure that your data is truly GDPR compliant. For example, with Hetzner Object Storage, you not only store your data in a GDPR compliant manner, but you can also easily scale it at any time flexible and securely, according to your needs. You can find all information for safe and worry-free hosting by following the link in the description. We're still following the plan to first release the RTX 5090 Astral block, which should be available quite soon. And you should be able to see a video about this soon on a different YouTube channel. And I can tell you, this project, it was a huge headache for not only me, but for our entire team. We basically invested about five months right now, and it's all about 10 people working full-time on this. It's crazy how much time you can put into development to make like a special block. We probably also made our own life a little bit difficult there, but you will soon see what I mean. What I can already show is our small cold plate for the RTX 5090 because it's like a modular design. So all the 5090 blocks will have this one. You already saw this before, I think in the 5090 Founders Edition video, but there it was not nickel plated yet. And that's the basically the final result, nickel plated. Ignore the B5, that's just a marking for me so I know which part I have in my hands, but you can see RTX 50 Pro and also the surface area of the cooling surface, which is about 21,000 square millimeters. I also read a lot of feedback under the 5090 Founders Edition video that people loved the copper look and said they would also love to buy it without nickel plating. Unfortunately, it wouldn't look that nice for a long time. Also, if you just touch it, you would see your fingerprints immediately. You can't wipe them off anymore. So it's not really an option for us. All the parts will always be nickel plated. And for this one, the water will flow in in the center and then move to the left and right. And you can probably also see that it's a quite fine structure. So we have about 0.2 millimeter wide fins. And the gap in between is even smaller. It's about 170 to 180 micrometers. So that's just twice of a human hair. And of those parts, we milled about 100 pieces and then sent them out to different nickel plating companies, also applied di different types of nickel plating, different thicknesses, and then performed corrosion testing. And that's what we will want, or that's what we want to do with this specific part as well. We will now do a corrosion test with this nickel plated copper piece that I just showed you. It's sitting in a glass jug and we will now fill it with coolant or with distilled water in this case. What we did is we put them on pieces of plastic so they're a little bit tilted and we will only add water until like here. So we can also simulate the part being fully submerged and also being outside because that's different for, yeah, it's a different type of corrosion. We're now putting this into an oven at 60 degrees Celsius because at a higher temperature, it's also accelerating the aging a little bit and sa just saves us time testing. Corrosion in a water cooling loop will depend on a lot of different factors, but it starts with the materials that are being used. And most people, they just have their, you know, copper cooler and um, like copper radiator in mind. And then they're like, yeah, I'm just using the same material for everything. But it's just a lot more complicated starting with the fitting. For example, this is a brass fitting, like most of the other fittings that are being used. Brass is copper, zinc, and it's also lead. Typically up to 4% lead are allowed and it's still ROHS compliant. And then, yeah, could be chrome plated. If we take a look at the radiator, the core is typically copper, but the front and back materials can be brass, similar to the connection terminals, typically brass as well, often also soldered. So you, you again have, you have copper, zinc, you have lead, and then if it's, yeah, if it's soldered, you have tin as well. 
and then it could be nickel plated. So it's, it's not just a copper radiator, this is five different materials. Same thing goes for the heatsink. If you think about your copper heatsink, for example, a big GPU block, it would again be copper and can also be brass sometimes, so again like zinc and lead. And then you might also have a jet plate that could be made from stainless steel, which is then iron and carbon. So overall, even if you think about I'm using a pure like copper based loop, you probably have up to, I don't know, eight to 10 different metals inside your loop without aluminum. And if you're now asking yourself the question why this is relevant with all the different materials, it's because of the galva galvanic series, which is a table you could easily describe this as the table of how reactive the metals are between or within each other. In this galvanic series, the table, you can find the elements that can be gold or copper, for example, in its reduced form, which is basically the elemental form. And next to it, you also have the oxidation state with the amounts of electrons that are being emitted. And then on the right side, you can see the potential in volts. And now we're getting back to the distilled water. Distilled water you could also describe as tap water that was evaporated and then condensed. And what you get back is just some very pure water without any dirt inside or for example also without any salts inside. And with salt I'm not talking about your typically sodium chloride that you would use at home for making food. I'm talking about ions. And I'm talking about positively and negatively charged ions. So those are cations or anions. Ions are atoms or molecules that carry a positive or negative charge. I'm sure you know this from mineral water where you can see those ions typically listed on the label directly. For example here where calcium Ca2 plus and magnesium Mg2 plus are listed. This means they both lost two electrons and are thus positively charged. On the other hand it could also be negative charge, for example a sulfate, if it acquired two additional electrons which makes it negatively charged. I hope this is not too complex, but it's really important to understand why the distilled water is such a big problem if you fill it without any kind of additives into your loop. For example, if you go, just go back to tap water, tap water would always contain additional ions, for example, calcium. And calcium together with hydrogen carbonate would then form what you can see as limestone in your loop. You would see those white marks building up and that's also just a result of ions. And those ions are not present inside the distilled water. But distilled water, or just also tap water, is a polar molecule, which means that it can easily take up any kind of ions from anywhere. And we just talked about how many different types of metals we have inside our cooling loop, potentially, even if we call it a copper type of loop. And if you fill it with distilled water without any kind of additives, it will just be a matter of seconds that the distilled water will take, will absorb ions out of your loop from all the different materials. May it be the copper, the zinc, the tin, the lead, whatever, within minutes. It's not that you can run this for, let's say, a day and not worry, it happens within minutes. And the result of this we can now see if we take back our corrosion test out of the oven. And here's our part after the corrosion testing. You can already see this coloring on the fins, but we will let it cool down and take it out. Now after drying you can see strong discoloration on top which almost looks like the nickel plating was removed and that the copper would shine through like this brown red stuff that we can see there. And just a reminder at this point we just put this piece of nickel plated copper inside distilled water with nothing else. Like there was no other material inside and the distilled water obviously didn't contain any other weird parts of coolant or anything. And now again under a normal light microscope you can see those dark spots where it almost looks like the nickel plating is gone. That is actually not the case. And that is something we can investigate further under the scanning electron microscope, but since this is not working with light, it is sometimes difficult to see a discoloration, which means we have to leave some sort of a marker on it. And for this we're just leaving a marker on the surface, scratching it basically, that is something we can still find later. In the infrared camera we can see our cold plate. This in the center will be our electron beam where it's coming from and then top right corner we have our EDX which is basically a material analysis unit. And that's what I meant earlier under the scanning electron microscope you can hardly see the discoloration but you can see the scratch that we left up here as a marker. Now zoomed in a little bit we can definitely see our scratch that we left. This should now be a good resolution to investigate this. What we can see here is the nickel plating 
here definitely the scratch, how we removed some of the material. And currently the field of view is 1.2 millimeters. So that is the entire field of view from left to right what you can see. This is the EDX material analysis unit I was talking about. And whenever the electron beam is scanning across the surface, this will be able to tell us which material we are looking at. And if we now zoom into this surface area and try to analyze this, then we're getting this spectrum and you can see that there is a detection of nickel, of copper, of oxygen, a little bit of phosphorus, which is part of the nickel plating. And then I did a comparison and compa compared an area where we didn't see visual corrosion and it looked exactly the same. So what happened in exactly this case is that the distilled water was taking up some of the copper ions, so the Cu2 plus ions from the part itself and it was basically deposited on the nickel itself. And in any kind of like piece like this, where you have a very fine structure, you often also saw this in my videos, that you, if you look in between the fins of some coolers, you can still see the copper, the naked copper, because it's very difficult to nickel plate down into the structure. And sometimes that's even impossible if you, for example, use electroplating, that is also often used. So it's quite common and it's absolutely normal that a distilled water would have direct contact with the copper, even though this is like a first look nickel plated part, then it takes up the copper ions, the Cu2 plus ions out of the copper. And this is then deposited onto, onto the nickel because those ions, they take two electrons from the nickel and it's basically copper plating itself. From a technical perspective, it's, it's actually not that terrible. It just looks bad. It looks really bad but it technically isn't really an issue because it's just a nanometer thin layer of copper that you're depositing on top of the nickel. So it first look, it looks like the nickel was etched away, but that's absolutely not the case. We just deposited a little bit of nanometer thin copper on top of the nickel. This can be a much bigger problem if you take a look at your entire loop and also what we discussed earlier with the broad range of materials that are being used because in the galvanic series, the copper and the nickel, they're fairly close within each other. So it's not that much of a problem. But then for example, we have the zinc inside, which is part of the brass and brass is much lower. And so it's much more of a base material, not as noble, which definitely causes more corrosion than you would might think. And that is definitely happening if you're adding distilled water and you use brass fittings, for example, you have brass inside your radiator, then it will cause discoloration, for example, of your nickel plated GPU heatsink. And often then people think, yeah, my nickel plating is bad, but it was just often the wrong coolant that was being used. And this is the exact reason why you have to use proper coolants. For example, the Aqua Computer DPU Ultra. We also ran the same test again, the same corrosion test with a similar part, same nickel plating, same nickel thickness, and also three times as long with the DP Ultra. Let's check the results. In my right hand, we have the sample that was submerged in the distilled water. You can also see the line until where the liquid was at. Underneath, it's like really bad. And on the left side, we have the one that was submerged in the DP Ultra for three times as long. Again, you can see the line where the water was at. So everything outside, it's kind of expected that you will see some kind of discoloration simply because it's also exposed to oxygen, but this is still fine. But everything that was fully submerged in the DP Ultra, there is no corrosion at all. There's nothing visible, even though this was used three times as long as this one. But why was it so much better using the DP Ultra, which also contains distilled water? Aside from the distilled water, you also have benzotriazole and also glycol inside. The glycol has also a negative effect because it's actually also decreasing the heat capacity. It means that your water can take up less heat without heating up. But a positive aspect is first of all that it has a good impact on the pH value. So it's increasing the pH value to set it more between 7 and 8. Without this, the distilled water can easier drop down in pH value going to maybe between 5 and 7, which is then even more attacking the metallic surface. But what is helping the corrosion is that the glycol sticks to the metallic surface, thus protects it not only chemically, but also like a physical barrier in between the distilled water and the metallic surface. The benzotriazole that is inside the DP Ultra works in exactly the same way. It's in a selective corrosion inhibitor. Inhibitor means that it's slowing down the corrosion. It doesn't fully prevent it, but it's drastically slowing it down. Works in the same way that the benzotriazole is sticking to copper related surfaces. So that is anything that is copper or brass. 
and because it's creating like a monolayer in between the coolant, which is basically the distilled water, and your copper, there is no direct interaction, which makes it really hard for the distilled water to take up more ions, or also if there are already ions present in the distilled water, to, t to yeah, deposit them back onto other metals. These corrosion inhibitors, they have to be selected according to the materials that are being used in your loop. You can even use a loop where you mix copper and aluminium. That also works fine if you have the right coolant, then ca that can work with both of the materials which is usually not the case for all the coolants that are being used in our industry. For example, the DP Ultra is not made for that. But most of the coolants, if you use a copper-based loop without aluminium, then let's say the DP Ultra or coolants 702 or Corsair XL5, those common liquids, they are usually very good. One thing I kind of neglected in this video is also biocides and other things that can happen in your loop, like algae building up and bacteria, but as that would just be too much for today's video. To wrap this up, a quick summary. Don't use distilled water without any kind of additives in your cooling loop. Also not for flushing the system, because the corrosion will immediately start, immediately within seconds and minutes. Because whenever you add fresh distilled water in your loop, it will immediately take out ions from different parts, like the brass out of the fittings, and then it will slowly deposit it somewhere else, for example, on the nickel plating. That is something, once it started, it will never go back. You can kind of stop it if you add a lot of additives to it, but you will never return or re reverse what already started. This means even if you want to flush your loop, for example, often you get radiators, they're new and you're like, okay, there could be some, some stuff left from the manufacturing. If you want to flush it, also flush it with clear coolant. Do not only flush it with distilled water because you would still again immediately start the galvanic corrosion because of the distilled water taking up the ions. One thing I also want to add is that those additives that are, for example, in the DP Ultra, they also degrade over time. So in theory, you would have to replace your liquid, let's say, once every one or two years to make sure that the corrosion is not occurring or is still very, very slow. So whenever you see the discussion again of somebody recommending just run distilled water without any additives, please send this video because the distilled water as clear as it is without any molecules inside, that's exactly the problem. It is a polar material, a polar liquid, which immediately takes up any ions out of anywhere and deposits it somewhere else because of the galvanic corrosion. I hope this was a good video. Let me know what you think. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.